So we are here at the Maker's Mark Distillery with Brad Boswell, Master Cooper, Kevin Smith, Master Distiller, and of course, Bill Samuels Jr., President of Maker's Mark. And we're here for the launch of Maker's 46. Bill, one of the things that I love, um, I read an interview uh, that you gave recently and, and you were talking about uh, your tenure at Maker's Mark and how you were just given an amazing product and you always kind of look back at your career as just not having screwed things up. Inadequate. <laughs> and we all know you've done so much more than that. But I'd like to talk to you a little bit about what this means to you personally because this is a big departure for Maker's Mark. It's the first new product in company history, right? For 52 years, my father and I have been fending off people that wanted us to be creative. I knew if I attack Kevin here with, hey, let's change gears and let's go do something straight on, he would uh, he would throw up. So I concocted this story. I came down and I said, Kevin, we got to have a serious discussion here. I just had a nightmare last night that scared me to death. I dreamt that I was being hauled out of the house in a wheelchair drooling. My wife was waving goodbye at me and we went into this nursing home. And I'm thinking, my God, my time is up. I haven't really done anything except not screw up Dad's invention. I get in and there's, there's, a, there's a stone mason there carving my headstone. And then he said, we'd like to put a little epitaph on the tombstone. What would yours be? And that's when I started feeling inadequate because the only thing I could think of was, well, I hadn't screwed this up yet. So I come down to Kevin and I, I told him this story. And I said, Kevin, can you help me? We got to create something new so I can at least put something on the tombstone. We were going to try to make a significant contribution to the state of the art of bourbon, something my family's been involved in since 1784 here in Kentucky, continuously. Wouldn't it be neat if we could create a maker's mark on steroids with no additional back mouth bitter aftertaste. Probably the best way to describe what we ended up doing though is to actually taste it. So what I have done is I've poured up Maker's Mark in the left glass and Maker's 46 in the right hand glass. Really you have to go back to what this was, how this was created back in 1953 and out of this dream of Bill's father to try and create a bourbon that when you smelled it and you, you began to look at it and actually put it under your nose, go ahead and smell it. Then when you smelled it, it actually had a flavor and an aroma, if you will, that enticed you to want to drink it. Absolutely. Unlike some of these whiskeys that you'll find that, you know, you want to put your crash helmet on, you got to strap yourself in to drink it. The other interesting thing is as you, as you taste this, immediately the nose and the taste just line up like a hand in the glove. And you see this, this unique flavor just kind of like encoat the mouth, but not the back part, not the sour which is just amazing to me. And I love that flavor, and so does Bill. And that's how we got to, can we amp this up in a way that would bring some of those lingering flavors a little bit more of a smoky, uh, sweet, toasty is a better word, toasty nose to the, to the aroma. We also wanted to try and take the vanilla and the caramel and, and kind of, like you said, put it on steroids, amp it up a bit. We wanted to kind of bring a little edginess to this. Instead of being rounded, we want to make it a little more edgy, a little bit longer, and a spiciness. Notice the toastiness that's there. It, it's a yeah. lot heavier, warm wood smells, not smoky, burnt wood. Take just a little sip of that. Mm. It's got a bigger flavor. Oh, wow. It's And you can see it kind of reach to your tongue. Now, all of a sudden, just when you thought it was going to like soften, it opens. It, opens it just does that, right, in your mouth. As it sits here in that glass, too, it'll even open up even more, almost like in a, in a way, kind of like a wine does, in the way that I think it coats the glass. I've even noticed, not to, to be too wine geeky here, but the fingers that are residue because of, of what we've done to this actually hang a little longer on the glass. And there's like a tactile or a spiciness, if you think of cinnamon or nutmeg, baking spices, that's out on the front of the tongue. And yeah, and you kept it all right in the front. To me, when I think bourbon, I think obviously charred American oak barrels, and um, we went we went a different way with with this product, didn't we? Well, l let me just take this because what we ended up doing with the wood chef here—that's literally what he does with wood. And he came to us with all sorts of different ideas. So we have 125 different experiments out there rolling around. 
Really? All of which, except one, <laughs> suck. They, they, they didn't work. <laughs> he came to me one day, and, and I need to get, get a piece of this to show you if you haven't seen it, this piece of wood. And he said, I think this might be the ticket. This profile wood was profile 46. This is a piece of the wood that, that we're talking about, and this is kind of what Brad brought. It was kind of interesting because he brought it to me. I was like, what am I supposed to do with this, Brad? <laughs> <laughs> he said, well, that's kind of up to you. There's a lot of different things. Well, I've been making barrels for a long time, all my life. My, my grandfather made barrels for Maker's Mark. So, you know, it's um, three generations into making barrels for the, the distillery here. We cook wood, that's what we do for a living. I mean, mm -hmm. barrels are a container, but really, oak, when it comes to barrels or maturation, is all about the aroma, flavor, texture. So over the past you know, 20 years, we've just dialed in different flavoring options based on the wood species, based on the, and based on how we cook it. For the folks who may not be familiar, when we're talking about cooking the wood, that's super important. We're, we're actually talking about caramelizing the sugars. We're creating the caramelized sugars and we're controlling the amount of tannin. By the amount of heat that yeah, you apply well, and yep. the level of char that how you long achieve. How we apply it. Right, it's sure. It's like cooking steak. It's like cooking steak or cooking food. This is um, it's French oak. It's from the Vosges Forest region in France. It's seasoned after we cut these staves. We season them for almost two years, about 18 months is a typical standard seasoning regime for this. Um, that's out under the sun, rain's falling down on it. So it, the water, rainwater is leaching out, you know, the tannins, which is really important, you know, because tannins are high, really? a lot of tannins are, you know. So the are, tannins are almost washed out before you yeah, get oh, yeah, it. They're soluble in water. If you go to the yard Fantastic. where they season, underneath the stack, there's puddles of brown water of tannin. What we're talking about are tannic acid, same thing we find in red wine. It's the bitter component that comes from the, the wood itself. After it's properly seasoned, then we take it to um, our kitchen, essentially, and <laughs> or something like that. That's what it really is. We sear it, I mean, to the point of just catching on fire, almost catching on fire. It doesn't catch on fire, like the inside of a whiskey barrel catches on fire. This does not catch on fire. That is the Maker's 46 Tanks tank. Steak. Kind of where Brad handed it to me and then it was my job to figure out what to do with it, uh -huh. was to take a set of these. Now actually we take two sets and introduce it into regular Maker's Mark. But first we make, dump 150 barrels of Maker's Mark. So we're literally making a recipe that we always have for Maker's Mark. Hold it in the tank, we take the barrels that we just emptied, stand it up on its end, remove the head by, by taking off the hoop and prying the head out, and then we insert these down into the barrel, affix it to the side, Put two sets in, so there's there's two sets, ten of these total in. Put the head back in, the hoops back on, roll it around, and take the whiskey out of the tank, the maker's mark, fully matured, put it back into the barrel with these, leaving them for two to three months. The searing process that Brad came up with, it's a unique process to the wood because we got both sides of the wood. We got deep penetration, but yet almost like a toast, but yet didn't burn it all up. Right. We got the caramelization like that. This is down in there and the whiskey is fully engulfed in this. This is immersed in there and what's going to happen to that is it's going to soak and penetrate into that. And in just two to three months, usually almost right around nine weeks, we get all this intense flavor and aroma. I do believe that Brad has come up with something here that is going to maybe open some doors to a whole other section of the bourbon experience. The scope of the project is, is mind-boggling, literally to change the state of bourbon. And I honestly can't think of another distillery that's in a better position to do it because that's what Maker's Mark did yeah. with its first iteration. Um, I mean, you literally created the premium bourbon market and all the small batches followed. And that's, that's what you guys do. I love the history. I love the heritage. I love the fact that it's an unbroken chain, that this is literally a second iteration, almost the butterfly from the chrysalis that is Maker's Mark. Again, it's not a better Maker's Mark. It's a different Maker's Mark. Best of luck, guys. I mean, just Thanks for coming down. outstanding. I do think that it's a great time to be in the bourbon business and the bourbon, be a bourbon connoisseur, be a bourbon drinker because over the last 20 years or so we've seen some incredible bourbons. We're back to Maker's Mark 50 years ago. It's just been getting better.